we, the three of us um, are kind of unique. I'm the only one up here. Well, no, um, Judge Trosh and I are both uh, professors, if you will, um, but neither of us teach in the I'm a lecturer, you're a student kind of a way. So the way I would love to kick this off is just to set the expectation that it's going to be participatory, um, it's going to be active, um, and we would like you to engage with us. Um, you are not receptacles of the information that we're presenting, but active participants in a dialogue that we would love to have for the next little while with you this morning. So without further ado, I am Susan McCarter. Um, you have before you Judge Lou Trosh and Miss Nakia Weiler. And I think the best way for us to introduce ourselves to you and tell you a little bit about our project, our presentation, and our work is to tell you how we came to the work of Race Matters for Juvenile Justice, because that's one of the ties that, that binds the three of us. So I'll just briefly tell you um, how I came to this work. I was living in Richmond, Virginia. I was working as a mental health counselor in the inner city um, of Richmond. I worked in three housing projects uh, with adolescents. I did adolescent mental health counseling. And I often found myself in court representing, advocating, helping, assisting my clients. Every time I walked into the court, I was kicked in the gut by the faces that I saw because the faces that I saw didn't look like me. And I knew there was something very wrong about that. And I knew when I watched what happened in the courtroom, people were treated differently and it wasn't based on their behavior and that's going to be a theme that you hear today. So when I moved here to Charlotte, I was already doing that type of work. When I finished um, my stint as a mental health counselor, I decided I needed to come at this problem from a different angle. I worked as a juvenile probation officer in the city of Richmond. I left, uh, when we left Richmond, I had two small children. I had a third one here in Charlotte. I decided while I was, while I had finished up some school work as a probation officer that um, my work as a DMC scholar nationally um, needed to continue in the, in the Charlotte community. And so I met Judge Trosh years and years and years ago, and we, the two of us, um, with some dedicated friends, kept looking, kept learning more, kept fidgeting, um, until we crafted what's come to be known now as Race Matters for Juvenile Justice. So that's how I came. Luke? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, Good morning. So uh, I'm a district court judge, and I grew up in Charlotte, and um, I always thought that all of my success in the world uh, was due to my incredible intelligence, <laughs> my amazing hard work, my uh, charming personality, uh, and my good looks. Uh, yeah, I know y'all, why y'all laugh at that part, right? Um, I have learned over time that though I think I'm charming, and though I have worked really hard, uh, and though I did well in school, um, I also had some help that I didn't realize. So you remember that song, The Wind Beneath Your Wings? I had some wind beneath my wings that I now recognize that I used to not recognize. Um, I want to tell you a quick story that led me to you today. And this happened about 10 years ago now. I'm a juvenile court judge for the most part. Now, as you all know, most of you in North Carolina, we are uh, judges of general jurisdiction. Our courts are general jurisdiction, meaning I can hear any type of case. But in Charlotte, uh, because it's such a large community, we specialize a little bit, so I normally hear juvenile matters. I was hearing a first appearance uh, one uh, morning or afternoon, 
And a first appearance, again, as most of you all know, is when a uh, young man or woman uh, is charged, or anyone is charged with a serious criminal offense, they have to come to court for, to be told what they're charged with, what their rights are, to uh, uh, make sure that they have an attorney appointed, uh, and then to decide whether or not, if they're an adult, they should remain with a bond, or should, they, what, should their bond or bail be set at. As a juvenile, we don't have bonds or bail, but to decide whether or not they should remain or be placed in detention. So that's all serious cases. So we do that for felony offenses. So I had two cases, uh, our two co-defendants, that were charged with an armed robbery. And I'll tell you a little bit about what happened. These two guys um, watched the movie, I think it was, there's a bunch of those Oceans movies, I think this is Oceans 11. I can't remember now which one it was, but you remember the movie, right? So they go, I'm, I'm old now, but I think everybody knows Ocean's Eleven, right? So they go, they're in Vegas, they pull off the big heist, right? And they, the crooked casino owner, they take him down and get all the money, right? So these guys watch the movie, spending the night at one of the guys' houses and decide, hey, we're as smart as these guys on, uh, on this movie. We should pull our own heist. But you know, we live in Charlotte, we don't live in Vegas. So there weren't any casinos, but there was a McDonald's down the street. So they go to the McDonald's and they wore Scream masks. You remember the movie Scream? The, oh, that movie, that, that mask, right? So they wear those masks, they go to the McDonald's. Unfortunately, they're horrendous criminals. They're nice kids, but they're terrible criminals. So they get, I think, two cheeseburgers and like $3.48. And they're running out of the store. That they get caught in the parking lot, okay? They are charged with armed robberies because they had uh, guns with them. So I called the first one in, and typically I, what I would expect, because in juvenile court, armed robbery is about as serious a crime as we hear, fortunately. We don't hear how many homicide cases first degree rape cases, those types of things. So armed robbery is about as serious as it gets. So I'm sitting at the bench and I'm expecting what happens, this door to open with the deputy leading the young man out. Uh, he's in shackles, they take the shackles off and he sits at the defense table with his lawyer. There is a district attorney uh, sitting uh, at, at their table and then there are other folks court counselors, case managers are, are sitting at another table. And so I let, let the young man know, oh, oh, one more thing, I call the case in, we have this little intercom system, so I call it in. And normally in juvenile court, I see a mom, maybe grandma, grandpa, maybe a dad, but that's about it. I don't get a lot of family support. Well, in this case, about I don't know, half again as many people that are in this room came pouring into my courtroom. So mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, cousins, neighbors, friends, a pastor from the church came. They had a stack of letters to tell me, judge, this is not who our son is. This is completely out of character for him. Please give him an opportunity. So I let him know all the, the uh, uh, rudiments of the probable cause hearing, what he charged with, etc. And then it comes time for the decision as to whether he's going to remain in detention. And what I hear is that this young man is a student at a suburban upper middle class high school here in Mecklenburg County. I won't say the name of it, but it starts with a B. And um, so if you're from Charlotte, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And he is an average student. He's not a great student, right? BC student. But he's never been suspended from school, which again, in my world, in juvenile court is a rarity when I, with the kids that I see in juvenile court, he's never been suspended, never really been in trouble in school. Uh, he uh, is uh, never been in trouble with the law, no evidence that he has any drug history, he's got tons of family support. I don't hear really any of the risk factors that I usually hear uh, um, uh, from the kids that are in court, right? So I'm thinking maybe, the, you know, maybe this kid is, this is just a completely out of character. I don't hear any gang involvement, any of those things. 
And so the recommendations, I asked for the recommendations about whether he should remain in detention or not. And the recommendations pretty much across the board, as they are typically in juvenile court in a serious armed robbery case, are judge. Today's Monday. We like to come back on Thursday uh, and refer him to what we call alternatives to detention, where we want to check out the story that we've heard from the family, make sure that he, in fact, has not had problems at school, uh, to make sure he's got the support that he said that his family says that he has, and to recommend whether he should be released with intensive supervision or an electronic monitor. Um, and so I said, okay, that's what we're going to do. We will come back on Thursday at 1.30. You're going to remain in detention until Thursday because I've got to check all this out. I tell the family, I've got to check all of this out. We've got to make sure this is a very serious charge that he is really an exception to the rule because normally if you're charged with an armed robbery in juvenile court, you're staying in detention until we deal with your case. Okay, everybody with me? So he leaves the courtroom with the deputy. The, family's all, uh, the family all leaves, and I call in the co-defendant. Uh, and so again, a, a million people come into my courtroom, right? Aunts, uncles, cousins, grandma, grandpa, dad, mom, friends, his brother's there like in a little blazer with his uh, khaki pants on in the courtroom. They're all there, and the deputy is sitting over in his chair, and he's just sitting there, and he's sitting there. Well, I've got a lot of other cases that I've got to hear this afternoon, so finally I say to the deputy, Mr. Bailiff, could you please go get the other co-defendant? And he said, there's nobody else back there, Judge. And I said, well, yeah, there is. And he said, no, there's not. And about that time, I realized that the young man in the blazer and the khaki is not the, the brother. He is the, defend, the, the co-defendant. So he's come up. He's now sitting at the defense table with his lawyer. We still have a district attorney, and we have the court counselors and the case managers, right? So I go through the whole thing. I find out he's also an average student. He didn't have a pastor uh, that came with him, but he had a coach from his school because he was an athlete at a school, um, and the coach came to support him. He had letters, etc. So I hear pretty much the same thing, totally out of character. <laughs> Never been in trouble before, no drugs, no suspensions, etc., etc., etc. Go through the process, and then I say to the uh, court counselor, is where I start. And so I say to the court counselor, Madam Court Counselor, what are your recommendations regarding detention? And she said, Judge, we want him to stay at home with his family, we want him to be on house arrest. We want him to go to school each and every day. Uh, we want him to have no contact with his co-defendant. We want him not to go to the McDonald's, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty standard rules for him. I ask the other case manager there, we're all good with that, okay? Go to the district attorney. Mr. District Attorney, what do you say about this? He stands up and says, we're good with that as long as he follows those rules, okay? I go to the defense attorney, then they're like, we're good, right? <laughs> so they, they sit down real quick. <laughs> and then I ask some questions, right? Okay, we just, we've had two cases. Was the other young man the gunman? No, they both had pistols. I'll let you all know. Later we found out that they were BB guns or pellet guns, but if you all have ever seen a pellet gun. They're not like when I was a kid. They're not like Red, Rock, Red Rider BB guns. They look like Glocks, right, or 357s or whatever. So they look like pistols. They both have it. I said, well, it was the other young man's idea. No, they watched this movie. They came, that's how I found out about Ocean's Eleven. They watched this movie. They were spending the night. No. They lived one street over from each other, went to the same school. They had been friends since they were like seven years old, six years old. Families were friendly with one another, uh, lived in the same neighborhood for years. I couldn't find any difference, save one. I could only find one difference. The fact that I don't even have to ask you if you know what the difference between those two young men, the only one I could come up with says it all about why we're here today. Because this, that was 2006. This is 2015. 
16. 16, you're right. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting old. I don't have any hair. I don't have any memory, so you've got to work with me here. It could happen today. In fact, it does. I could tell you stories um, about what goes on now. <laughs> the fact that you also know which one of the young men was white and which one of the young men was black says even more. I don't even have to ask you. I had one person, I've told that this story, I don't know, probably a hundred times or more now. I've had one person who was not from the United States raise their hand and say, I don't know what the difference is. One didn't know the answer. One. Whether, I'm, whether you know you're talking about, I'm coming to talk to you about implicit bias or not. So I do what I have been trained as an American to do in that moment when we talk about bias and race, right? You know what I did. I looked for Archie Bunker. Now you students don't know who the hell Archie Bunker is, but the old people like me know who Archie Bunker is, right? He was a guy in a show called All in the Family. In fact, he had just died recently. But it was a groundbreaking series because this guy was the prototypical bigot, right? He was, so I'm looking for who is it that wants to lock the black kid up and not the white kid. And that's my first thought, right? Is it the cops? Is it the DA? Is it the court counselor? Who is it? But then I look around the room and I realize, wait a minute, I know all these people. I work with them. We're in court sets, so we have different parts of the city, so I work with the same people every day. I know all of them. I, our court counselor was African American. Our district attorney was white. Our defense attorney, I think, was uh, also uh, was white, okay? So I had white people, black people, men, women in court, all making the same recommendations. And I look around, I'm like, there's no Archie Bunker here. In fact, I knew one of the police officers that arrested him and didn't think that he was, they were arrested him to begin with, that he was looking to paint them differently. So now I'm going, oh my God, What's going on? Because something else is going on beyond let's find who the racist is, fire them, you know, nail them, call them out. Not call them in, Renee, call them out. <laughs> and move on. I realized something else was going on. And that something else led me on a journey that led me to meet Susan and later Nakia and other, some other people that are in this room that were looking for similar answers. So we're going to talk to you today about what I think, or we think, was going on beyond who's Archie Bunker. By the way, I locked up the white kid. I didn't accept the, you know, Miss Jared thinks I should have let them all out, but I didn't. I said to the young man, I said, look, this is an armed robbery, this is a serious offense, we're going to have your hearing Thursday. You're much of the chagrin of his family. They were shocked. You are going to go to detention. We'll come back Thursday and see if you should be released. Both of them, by the way, were released subsequently on alternatives to detention on Thursday, on that next, on three days later on Thursday, uh, and ended up never. They, they dealt with those cases, but never came back to juvenile court. The key up. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so, following Lou, tough act, but you know, I'll do what I can. So, um, as Susan alluded to at the beginning, this is going to be a very interactive session, and I'm probably the most interactive of the three of us because, by profession, I'm a facilitator, I'm a trainer, um, and primarily I do this work with young people. The organization that I'm happy to say that I'm the founder of get to that later on in my sort of part of the presentation. But founder of is called Possibility Project Charlotte. Um, and we're one of several sites across the country and overseas. And what we do is we work with young people, helping them become leaders. I love helping young people become leaders. It's why I get up in the morning. It's my favorite thing. Helping them become the best citizens and productive, active, young people and future adults that they can be. Until uh, something happened to me, this is our 15th year um, 
in my 15th season of doing this work based on community justice and performing arts. But something has happened over the past five years that gave me pause. And what gave me pause is that no matter how the young people in the Possibility Project succeeded individually, it didn't change what happened collectively in their communities. It didn't change what their schools looked like when they came back after their five-year reunions. It didn't change, and I don't mind saying names, it didn't change what Geringer looked like. It didn't change what Philip O'Berry looked like. It didn't change what Harding looked like. It didn't change what Butler looked like. And so the young people that I work with are from all these different schools, yes? So what would happen is, I'm going to talk about this a lot in my presentation too, there's this thing called legacy that we all like to talk about in 2016. And so because I've been doing this for long enough, um, even though I'm only 20, even though I've been doing this long enough, um, the young people's brothers and sisters would come through. And what would happen is it's like, okay, somebody graduated 10 years ago, then their brother and sister would come through from these schools that I mentioned with the exact same condition and story. And sometimes even worse. But this is despite all the hard work of all of the staff at the Possibility Project to make sure that the young person ahead of them succeeded. So, so where's the trickle down effect? Oh, there is none. Because what you can't do is take one young person, sort of pull them out, and expect for all boats to rise. But that's kind of the fabric of this country. That, that's sort of what we believe. So three years ago, I ran into this um, organization called RMJJ, Race Matters for Juvenile Justice. And what it did is it showed me and taught me why that's true that no matter how many mentors, how many staff people, how many program officers work with individual young people to help them be better, do better, and do more, we still have a responsibility to, to unpack why that isn't really moving our communities. So that's why I'm involved and engaged in this work. And ultimately, the young people that I work with become us become you, and if they don't understand um, the legacy or connection, then we will continue to lose generations of young people, despite our good intentions. And so I'm excited to be here today, but I'm nervous. Because what we're going to share with you today um, will be challenging probably frustrating, probably irritating, might even make some of you just leave this room and go, why, I, 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 can't, I can't take any more from our session alone. But without actually going through the challenge of it, like all of us have done in our various positions, and people out here, Renee, that we will refer to, um, Deb with CMS, who we'll refer to, Ty, who's a, another judge, Without actually going through that challenge, Derek here, who does work in the community, then you would have, for lack of a better phrase, wasted some time that we don't want you to waste. We're going to start with Joe Friday. We've mentioned Archie Bunker. Now we're going to come up with some more old TV uh, <laughs> illusions. Joe Friday was just about the facts. Um, we're going to give you some facts. We're going to show you some data. We're going to start in a pretty uh, innocuous place, um, just with some numbers. Raise your hand if you like numbers. 
No, I mean really. Raise your hand. You like numbers. All right. I see you. Yeah. I'll be calling on you guys in a minute. So here's our for you uh, for you organization freaks out there who want to have an agenda of what we're going to do or talk about. Here's what we're going to do. One, two, three, four, five. That's what we're going to accomplish today. Learning objectives, whatever you want to call them. I like to get people all on the same page with some definitions. I appreciated that Ms. Blake did that this morning. We actually use the same implicit, explicit definition from um, the National Center State Courts. So I'd like to start with disproportionality. We, we toss that word around a lot, and it gets a bad rap, that word disproportionality, right? It's a bad word, right? Sometimes we might even have to whisper it, disproportionality. What is disproportionality? Who wants to venture? There's a definition here, but who wants to tell me what it means? She will call on people. You can read the slide if you don't want to venture your own. <laughs> Did I mention the interaction part? Thank you, ma'am in the, in the back. Okay, for me, I would have thought that disproportionality would be an imbalance. But to the slide, it says categories are out of proportion by size or number. The term disproportionate is not inherently good or bad. It depends on the goals or desired outcomes. So your definition of imbalance is perfectly legitimate. It's imbalance. They're out of proportion. That's all it means, right? Why do I have a picture of a cookie here? Because they're never the same. Okay, they're never the same. And raise your hand if you're a recipe follower. Raise your hand if you're not a recipe pot, right? You're one kind of a person. You either cook, you know, lock, stock, and barrel from the recipe, or you make that shit up as, as you go, right? <laughs> so if one day you're feeling particularly nutty, get it, and you want to put more nuts in your cookies than the recipe calls for, you would have a disproportionate amount of nuts. If you happen to like nuts, that's a very good thing, right? You like nuts? Yes. You like them in your cookies? There you go. <laughs> Disproportionality doesn't have to be a bad thing. It just means the, per the percentages or the proportions are off. Disparity, however, begins to give a picture of things aren't the same and to a detrimental end, right? If we're supposed to have the same amount of status or pay or privilege or access and we don't have the same amount, then though that's disparate and that's bad if we're on the short end of that sip, right? Who is this? Who's this picture of? Lady, Lady Justice. Lady. And what does Lady Justice have going on? She's blindfolded. I mean, she's not really blind, right? She's just blindfolded, right? Okay, why is she blindfolded? <coughs> Equity. Justice is blind. Okay, well, just tell me what that means. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but what? It's blind to what? Uh, it's blind to, uh, well, I guess we're talking about race, so uh, it's blind to race. Right. Blind to gender. Yep. Blind to uh, your uh, economic status, socioeconomic status. You're, you're mentioning a few of my favorite variables. We're going to talk about those in depth in just a second. Right, she's blind to your circumstance. She's blind to who you are. She's going to do what? What else does she have going on? She's got some scales in her hand. What does she do with the scales? Well, i got two sitting judges in the room. i got one wannabe judge. Any other judges? <laughs> what do the judges do, right? <laughs> what, what do you do with the scales? By the way, guys, she's just going to say anything. Oh, it takes one to know one, my friend. What does she do with this? What, you, what, what would you do with the scales? She's trying to balance those different things that are um, we're talking about, economic, the... the no, bags, no. She's people. not, because she's not paying attention to those. She's blind to those, right? She's going to weigh the evidence. She's going to weigh the evidence of whatever you've done, regardless of who you are, who your mama is, who your daddy is, what kind of car you drive, regardless of all that stuff, she's going to weigh the evidence that comes before her blindly. And then what does she do with this? She delivers a punishment based on the evidence. Everybody with me? All right. So this, when we go back to this definition of disproportionality and disparity, you have to think about what the values are. 
What are the values or the goals of your organization? If we're in a justice kind of an organization, this is what we expect. She's blind to your circumstance, she weighs the evidence, and she levies the punishment or the consequence only based on the evidence of your behavior. Are there any other institutions that you can think of that have some of these same values? Hey, Deb, what about education? Right? So education, the grade that you get in your law class is supposed to be dependent on that paper that you wrote. Right? It's supposed to work that way. What other institutions ascribe to these values or these goals? Law enforcement. Law enforcement? Health care. Government. Government. All right, keep that in mind. Let's talk about race, right? We've mentioned it. I like to get everybody on the same page when we talk about race. What is race? Somebody define race for me. If you can't, there's a definition right here. Thank you. Physical char characteristics such as skin color, bun structure, hair type, or eye color. Okay. Is it scientific? Okay, so I can't swab your DNA and figure out what race you are? Okay. How, we also say that it's historically provisional. What does that mean? We define race differently in 2016 than we did in 1816 or 1716. is gonna tell us a little bit about that in a few minutes. What does it mean when we say it's provisional? It means it, de it depends on the time and the context of where we are. The definition of race in the United States is different than the definition of race in Greece. It's bound by where we are, the time where we are, etc. All right, ethnicity, you have a definition up here of ethnicity. Let's talk about in 2010, the United States Census Bureau gave us categories. The, the Government Accounting Office wants us to standardize these categories. Name the categories that we were offered in the 2010 Census. What box could you check when the census taker knocked on your door? Okay, well, so uh, Hispanic was a separate question, but when they asked about race, are you white? White was an option. White or Caucasian? What else? Black, African American. Keep going. You're on a roll. Asian. Pacific Islander. Okay, Pacific Islander. What do we match? Who do we match the Pacific Islanders with? Usually Asian. Usually say Asian Pacific Islander. Well, no, yeah. So Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, and then we can say Native American, or who do we put with the Native Americans? Indian, okay? All right, and then in 2010, we were offered another option. We were offered a multiracial option. Now, a couple of you mentioned Asians. How many Asian folk, if we in this room were to say how many people we would classify as Asian, how many people would we classify as Asian worldwide? Give me a number. <laughs> Throw out a number. My number, people, where are you? Give me a number. Four billion is exactly right, plus or minus a couple hundred thousand. Four billion people we would classify as Asian. Can we make a characterization or a generalization about four? Can we say they're all smart? Four billion people. <laughs> right? Okay. Multiracial. 2010, we were all, we could we could check the box of multiracial. How many people in now in the U.S. not worldwide? How many people in the U.S. in 2010 elected to check the box multiracial? Give me a number or a percent. I can go either way on this one. I'm sorry. Three percent. Three percent of the of the U.S. population in 2010 identified as multiracial. That's about nine million people. Uh, okay, so why do we even check these categories? 
if you can check a box that says I'm multiracial, and we're not talking about a small percentage of people here. We're not talking about the people in this room, right? Why continue to check a box about something that we know is depends on time, place, history, it's not scientific? Raise your hand if you think we should continue to check a box and identify racially. Okay? A lot of people not raising their hand. All right, so that means the rest of you don't want to check the box anymore? Why, why what's an argument for either checking or not checking boxes? I feel like it's not based, like when I have to check a box, I feel like it's not based on the information that I'm providing. Like I may have this great resume, but it's like, oh, I have to select that I'm African American, so you're not looking at my merits that I have, this long list of accolades, but my race is coming into play of, of <laughs> What does that mean? What does that have to do with what I can do for you as an organization? Okay. All right. So that would be an argument for why not to check the box. Um, I know in my house, my significant other, every time he fills out an application, he says, babe, do you think I should put that on black? Because if they just look at my name, then they might think I'm white and I might have a better chance of getting an interview, even though he has these great credentials and you know all these other great things going for him. He feels if he checks this box, he more than likely won't get this interview. So you guys both made arguments for why you don't want to check the box, and I would actually say that's why we need to continue to check the box, because the minute that we stop checking the box, we lose the data on how people are treated differently, why they get fewer callbacks, because they check the box. So as long as we're collecting those data, we can actually show how people are treated differently. So that's what I'd like to do now, is kind of show you a little bit of data, and I'm going to try and do it quickly. All right, here are the contact points in the juvenile justice system. For those of you who don't know this, lots of people I talk to don't know what these steps are. I'm hoping most of you do, so I'm going to cut right to the chase. This was a study that was done in 2009. Uh, I know the author really well. So I looked at two dependent variables. Diversion, whether or not you were diverted. What does it mean to be diverted in the juvenile justice system or from the juvenile justice system? by the diversion program, so it's uh, well, something other than uh, being punished. So if you can accomplish, uh, complete a program, then you can possibly divert um, uh, a harsher punishment. So you don't actually have to go into the juvenile court system. What are some things that we think about when we think about diversion programs? What kind of tasks are young people given? Community, Community service. Community service, right? Okay, so that's, that's an idea of what diversion. You come in, you get in trouble somehow, okay, so I'm either going to send you to juvenile court or I'm going to give you the option of this diversion program, maybe with some community service. I looked at that as one endpoint. The other endpoint I looked at was the last contact point in the, in the nine contact points, or eight or ten, depending on your state, whether or not you were incarcerated. These data were from the Commonwealth of Virginia. I liked the variables that my justice uh, friend gave to me earlier. He mentioned a couple of these. He mentioned uh, race, he mentioned education, he mentioned family income. I also looked at whether people came from an urban, suburban, or rural location where they lived. And I looked at family structure, right? I looked at one parent household, two parent household, group home, Kinship care, grandma, you name it. I think I had 42 categories, 42 options uh, for family structure. I also looked at the number of prior petitions the young person had, and I looked at the severity of those, position, those petitions on a crime severity index. Why are these two red and the rest of them green? Because of things that court would consider. Yes. Yes, right? These are the two that are weighed on the justice scales, and these are the ones that you're supposed to be blind to. When we talk about these in the literature, these are extra legal variables, and these are the legal variables. These are the ones that your punishment should be dependent upon. All right, so for diversion, there was one variable out of these seven that predicted diversion. I want to show a hands. Remember we said interactive, right? All right, raise your hand if you think it was crime severity, quickly. Okay, raise your hand if you think it was prior record. 
Okay, raise your hand if it's family income. Raise your hand for education, race. Ha, you guys are in an implicit bias workshop, aren't you? <laughs> Urban, suburban, rural locations, and family structure. All right, you raised your hand for crime severity, right? Congratulations. Crime severity was the only thing that accurately predicted or statistically significantly predicted whether or not you were diverted. It was an inverse relationship. The more crime, the, the more severe your crime was, the less likely you were getting trash pickup, right? You commit armed robbery, they're not sending you back out into the community to fill community service hours. Everybody with me so far? Okay. I also looked at incarceration, right? There were four variables that predicted incarceration. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand. I'm gonna tell you that crime severity and prior record both were statistically significant. Makes you feel good as attorneys out there, right? Okay, the system's working kind of how it should. What were the two green ones that also statistically significantly predicted incarceration? Race, all you people that raised your hand, yes, you can raise your hand this time, race. You get one more. Where they live, family, family, family structure. It was not family structure. Education. where they live. It was not income. Urban. Education. It was not urban, it was education. Okay, now here's the punchline of the story. The strongest predictor, you know it was education, you know it was race, you know it was crime severity, you know it was number of prior petitions or prior record. Of those four, what was the strongest predictor of whether or not a youth would be incarcerated? Education. Race. Race was the strongest predictor of incarceration. That's not true. There's it, no way. Oh, come on. I know, but I don't know that it's love. I know. I know. The second strongest predictor, my friends, was education. So both of our extra legal variables had a stronger impact than our legal variables. All right, I like to give you data. I like to show it to you in the same way. I like to give you the site in case you wanna find these yourself, turn them in on a term paper, whatever you need them for. They're easily accessible and reputable, valid, reliable data. All right, this is the United States, 300 million folk. North Carolina, nine million folk. Somebody tell me, how North Carolina is different than the U.S. contextually, demographically, by race and ethnicity. Everybody see those? All right, we got more black folk in North Carolina, right? In the, in the U.S. context, the percentage of black folk is 13.2. In North Carolina, we have 22%, but we have fewer Hispanic and Latino brothers and sisters, right? As opposed to the US context. The white percentage is about the same. 64 in North Carolina, 62 in the US. Everybody with me? You know what these numbers are? Just Census Bureau numbers. Here we go. Everybody hold on to your hats. Ready? She's ready. All right, here we go. This is public school enrollment. Now this was the 2013 census. The rest of the numbers I'm going to show you are all from the school year 11-12, okay? Public school enrollment. What happened from this slide to this slide? Uh, much fewer Caucasians in public education. Yeah, okay. We got fewer white folk in public education. How come? Uh, Private school. Parochial school, home school, depends on the jurisdiction. Deb would tell us that magnet and charter schools are in CMS, but th this pie over here is nationally. Sometimes those don't fall under the umbrella of public school. Okay? The other thing that's happening in this slide, which is a little, you know, it's worth mentioning, this is only people that are public school aged. The general demography is older, so the younger folks have more folks of color, right? Everybody following along? Okay, public school enrollment. Let's look at out of school suspension and in school suspension, just for giggles. Okay, here is in school suspension. In school suspension. 
What's going on, party people? What happened from here to here? Blitz. Yeah, right? We got Pac-Man going on. So here, 52.3% of kids in school are white, but only 38.5% of kids who have one, at one in school suspension are white. 26.4 in North Carolina are black, as opposed to 43.5%. All right, hold on to your hats. Here we go, out of school suspension. Am I cooking these numbers up in my basement? <laughs> okay, they're a publicly available data. This represents folks that have been out of school suspended more than once. All right, at this point in the presentation, I got lots of people who sit in the room and say what? They might not say it out loud, but they're thinking what? <laughs> Few will articulate that, but I'm glad you said it. <laughs> My point is, they'll say, well, black kids act up more than white kids. That's why they're suspended more. They misbehave more, right? Well, if you didn't get the point here that that's not happening, let me show you a different way. Here's North Carolina, same offense type. Okay, these, all these kids had the same exact offense. The only thing that was varied was their race and ethnicity. Now, is this just happening in education? I've just shown you education slides. I'll read to you the categories on the bottom here in case you can't see them. Diabetes deaths, uh, and this, the colors are the same. So here you see that Caucasians, Hispanic, Latinos, African Americans, the Caucasian line is the control line, so that's the white line, and you can see how those numbers compare to Hispanic and Latino numbers and black numbers for diabetes deaths, infant mortality, students below grade level, student suspensions, prison population, searches per seat belt violation, children in foster care, children below the 200% poverty line, and the level of unemployment. I'm going to end with my last definition. How would you all in this room define racism? Judge Trosh talked earlier about he was looking for Archie Bunker, right? You look for the Dylan Roofs, you look for the KKK, you look for the people, the bad people. Frank Baumgartner, my friend who did this police stop and search, police stop data here in North Carolina, he took out all the most egregious offenders, all the cops who were overrepresenting, and he found that the rate was relatively unaffected. Racism is about a system, not about a few bad apples or about an individual. I invite you to write this URL down. Um, it's a link to a short video that'll show you cross-sectional data. Um, it's actually pretty well produced. I like it a lot, but at the bottom, at the end, it also gives you all the citations for the research that's used to produce the video. Take it away, Lou. So if, if you don't like Susan's statistics, Dr. McCarter's statistics about North Carolina education, look at Texas. There's a study called Breaking School Rules. It's a comprehensive study that studied a million kids in roughly in Texas over a longitudinal period. And what they showed when they controlled for 80 variables, I think it was, that when two kids, like my two kids, live on the same street, same family structure, everything else is the same. <clears throat> Black kids and white kids were suspended at different rates for the same offenses. And interestingly, most interestingly to me, for mandatory offenses, the really bad stuff, carrying a gun to school, selling drugs on campus, right, extortion, those kinds of things, the rates were the same. For discretionary offenses, I could go back and show you, these are discretionary offenses. The rates were way out of whack, meaning when a principal or a school resource officer or a teacher was faced with 
the same behavior from similar kids, they handled it very differently. And North Carolina is not alone. So, you're in law school. This is your brain. This is where you are now, a lot of you. Those of you that are former in law school, you can relate to this too. This is your brain after law school. Now, those of you that are in law school, am I right about this or not? Is this basically what Charlotte School of Law is doing to your head right now? I went to Chapel Hill and did the same thing to my head scrambled, Judge Hans' head scrambled from law school. Everybody who's a lawyer in here, Ms. Blake, right, happened to you too. So you're not alone. But I do, we want to turn now to talk about your brain. Not just about your scrambled brain from law school, but how your brain works to try and get at why are these numbers so skewed for kids doing the same thing out of the same circumstances. Is it really that everybody, because it's not just white people, by the way, when you look at schools that are run by black administrators or Hispanic administrators, rates are the same. So it's not just white people, right? So everybody somehow seems to treat similar things done by people from similar situations differently. So either we're all Archie Bunker or your brain's doing something. So I want to talk first about how your brain operates. You see this little, I hate these little red, the little laser thing, I just, I've always hated those. You see that little red spot in there? That is um, your amygdala. That's a Greek word that is Greek for almond. It's an almond-shaped structure. In fact, there are actually two of these almond-shaped structures in your brain, and they have a lot to do with how you process information. They control what happens when stimuli comes in to make you fearful or angry or you've got to make a quick decision. So you can see from this, this is sensory data that comes into your brain, right? So it comes into your brain, it is directed to the limbic system uh, and the amygdala, right? So it's sent to the uh, amygdala and then your amygdala says either we're going to send it upstairs, right, to the, the administrative team, your cognitive part of your brain, right, the, the frontal lobe, to make a rational decision and weigh all the facts like Lady Justice, or we got to do something fast, so screw those guys upstairs, we're just going to do something, right, and you, and you uh, send a stimuli out of your body. That's good sometimes, right? If you're in the water, and you see this guy, right? You don't want to go, hmm. I was watching, uh, Discovery Channel had Shark Week on last week, and I think this is a shark, but there are a lot of different kinds of sharks, like nurse sharks are not dangerous to people. And I know great whites and tiger sharks, and I think bull sharks are dangerous, but I'm not really sure. And would this be, a, this kind of looks like that thing in that movie. But you know, there are other things in the ocean, dolphins, and they are really nice to people. And I've always wanted to swim. You don't want to do that. You see this thing and you say, what? I'm going to get the hell out of the water. And once I'm on the beach, I'll think about what kind of thing it was in the water. <laughs> Same thing if you see that guy in the woods. So it can be very helpful. Your amygdala says, we're not doing this rational processing. We're going to say, get out. And oftentimes, by the way, you are already reacting. You're not sure why you're reacting when the message gets sent to your frontal lobe. And then you go, why am I getting, oh, yeah, there's something awful in the water. So you literally are acting faster than your frontal lobe gets the message because it's so efficient. These shortcuts or that shortcut is called a heuristic. A heuristic is a really fancy name for mental shortcuts. Mental shortcuts, these heuristics, help us in many different ways. They help us in a fight, flight, or freeze situation, right? So you can act really quickly. Do I need to punch this person back when they are threatening me, or are they threatening me? Do I need to run away? Or do I need to freeze? There's another, what's the other one? Uh, freeze, fight, fight, flight, run, or freeze. freeze. I thought there was a, a anyway, there's freeze. something that kids do, also uh, infants, but anyway, fight, flight, or freeze gets it. In addition, every day, all day, we are getting bombarded by stimuli. So Ms. Blake here is, Dr. Blake here is 
bombarded with a bunch of stuff, hitting her all the time, as are all of you. So she's got a muffin here that she ate. She may have liked it, she may have not. She may still have some of the taste of that muffin in her mouth, or maybe she had some water to get the taste out of her mouth. And now she's, her stomach is going, well, I'm kind of full, but I really could eat some more. That's going on internally. Maybe the, uh, the vent here is blowing on her, so she's thinking, am I cold, am I not cold? Maybe Derek here is, like, in law school, you guys are in law school, you know in law school there's always somebody that comes in like a little bit late and they've got a pack of crackers and maybe a bag of chips and they spread all their stuff everywhere and they're, you know, with, the, with their bag and they eat the chips hum, 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 really loud, right? There's a guy named Jim Carr who was, that I always seemed to sit next to me in law school and he was that guy, right? He's spreading all of my stuff. Well, maybe. Derek's doing that to Dr. Blake, and so she's like, God, we get out of here. And maybe you're really hungry for lunch, and so your stomach's growling, and her ears are hearing that. All day long, we are bombarded with stimuli, and your brain cannot process all, it cannot process all the stimuli. It cannot do it. And so your brain is constantly doing triage, figuring out, do I really need to pay attention to this, or can I just do this on autopilot? Do I really need to pay attention to what Derek's doing, or the stomach growling? No, 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 that's not really that important. And you're making those decisions, most of the time, unconsciously. You don't even know that you're making those decisions. Your brain also has to categorize this information about what is it going to require me to do? And do I need to think through this in order to accomplish a task. Why is yogurt here? If you, a funny story, I never get sent to the store anymore. The first time my wife sent me to the store, this is a true story, she said, get some milk. Milk, all she said was milk, right? I couldn't even do that. So she, so I, I go to the store, I get the milk, I bring it home, and she looks at it, she says, what is acidophilus milk? So I don't know, it was in the milk aisle, it was in the cart that we always get, I don't know. It was, I bought goat's milk. So, that's an example of yogurt. So if someone asks you to get yogurt, you don't think, now, I'm on a diet or not on a diet. Maybe you do, but oftentimes you're just like, you go to the yogurt aisle, you get the same one you always get, you look at the, the thing, you don't even think about it, you, you pull it up. You don't. They put those labels on the yogurts so for us to read. Nobody ever reads those things, right? You just go, you get the yogurt, you pick it up. That's what I did that day when I went to get the milk, right? It was in the same carton. The color was kind of the same. I didn't even think about it. I was in a hurry. I grabbed it. I went home. Now, it worked out well for me because I don't ever go to the store anymore. <laughs> so that automatic processing can really help us. One other thing that it does, real quickly, making decisions rationally is not only slow, but it is taxing. It takes a lot of energy. I sit on my rear end all day, every day. Right, Judge Hannah? That's what we do. And we hear what the, the disputes among people. Right? We have these ergonomic chairs so that we're comfortable in our chairs because we sit there all day. Sometimes at the end of the day, I feel like someone has beaten me all day or I have run a marathon. I am exhausted. I roll home. I say hello. I kiss my wife and say, I'm going to bed. And I just go straight to bed and collapse. And I haven't done anything physically. But they have done study after study to show that the decisions that you make when you cognitively process it, you don't notice it like when you're running a mile, you know, when you're running or doing physical activity, you notice how tired you get. In the moment, you don't notice how tired you're, you're getting or how much energy it takes for you to think through something in a cognitive, rational way. So this triaging also saves energy for your brain when your brain's like, we don't really need to spend all this energy and all this time on this decision just get the milk, right? So it's very helpful. In fact, I need somebody to read this for me. Uh, Derek, we're gonna let you and Dr. Blake help us here. Derek, can you read the first paragraph here, this right here? Can you read that out loud for us? <laughs> 
A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D A E O K A D The rest can be a total mess, and you can still read it without a problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the whole word as a whole. You're doing shortcuts even when you read, because we've done it so often. After not, Little kids don't do it this way, right? Little kids have to sound, you've read the little kids, they have to sound the whole thing out. But once we get to the place we are, we can read, they've done it where people read whole books. Just on the first and the last. And that's the only difference here. Here, the first and the last letters are also out of place. Here, so the whole thing's scrambled. Here, everything's scrambled but the first and last letter, and you can read it on mental shortcuts. So it's, it can be very helpful. At the same time, it can lead to mistakes. So I need everybody out loud to uh, repeat after me. I want you to read, not after me, but I'm going to click a button, a, a word is going to come up, I want you to read the word, okay? Read the word loudly out loud, loudly. everybody loud, everybody proud, okay? It's Friday, come on, the Panthers are going to the Super Bowl, let's enjoy it. Yeah. That's why I was late, by the way. Watch WBT tonight, the judge's dad. That was Judge Hand. She, she left the room. That's why she's wearing a Cam Newton. I'm frightened to see what, but that's where I was. <laughs> really, I am not the guy to be dad. But anyway, all right, ready? Out loud, proud. Crazy. Black. Red. Blue. Yellow. Blue. Green. Red. Black. All right, very good. Give yourselves a round of applause. Do very well. Now I want you to say the color of the word. Okay, don't read the word, say the color of the word out loud and proud. Ready? Red, Black. yellow, <laughs> green, green, blue, green, blue, red, brown. That's called the stroop test. What that demonstrates is your brain is, is, has been taught and created a neural pathway, a shortcut, that you don't have to go through and process all of it. It goes immediately to we have been taught and our brains have been structured by the way we are enculturated to create neural pathways to read words. That's our fallback position, not to say the color of the word. So that shortcut helps us a lot of times, but it hurts us when we're asked to do something else. Y'all notice sort of the hiccup. You all, some of you said it out loud wrong. Those of you that said it right, you notice just a quick little hiccup, right? It's yellow, right? That's what happens to all of us, and that's because of these shortcuts that our brains use in order to help us function. Heuristics. There are a lot of heuristics. Some of those heuristics have to do with what I talked to you about, fight, flight, or freeze. Others, and there are hundreds of these, have to do with, um, are they found, um, help us relate to the world quickly and easily. So they're shortcuts that we use to size things up, to figure out how things work. I'll talk about these really briefly. We want to focus on this last one. The availability heuristic is really simple. The availability heuristic says that your brain more readily accepts information that's easy for it to pull up. So what you hear the most, or what's easiest for you to process, you will believe more readily, you will cling to even when more complicated information tells you otherwise. Best example, you all have done this in law school, but lawyers in the room. Have you ever been in a courtroom and you're presenting in front of a jury or in a no negotiation and you have all the numbers and you have chart after chart after chart that proves 
that your side should win the case. So you have all the statistics, and you present all the statistics. And then the other side gets up, and they don't have any statistics because all the statistics are against them. And they tell a damn story about their grandma. (laughs) And then you sit and you wait for the jury to reach its verdict, and they come back and they side for the other guy and the grandma. That's because our brains more are designed because of human evolution, the way we learned information a long, long time ago, to accept stories. It takes less cognitive load for us to grasp and understand a story than it does to pour through charts and statistics. So we accept those more readily. So you don't take anything else out of here today, take this. When you're in front of a jury or you're in a negotiation or you're making a presentation, don't just put the statistics up. You will lose every time. Nobody, you'll have a great argument and nobody will listen to you. Have a story to go along with it, to put it in context. Because once people get the story, then they can accept your statistics. Uh, representative heuristic is basically you have a prototype of things in your brain. And so if the sit- factual situation in front of you fits the prototype or what you come to expect, then you are more likely to um, find it to be true or to accept it. In, co- in law terms, a real good example is juries are more more readily convict defendants who kidnap by uh, going to somebody's house, taking a child like the Lindbergh, God, we're going old school, Lindbergh baby, right, and demanding a ransom than if they hold an adult, take an adult somewhere, don't demand a ransom. Both are defined under legal terms as kidnapping. One fits what our mind and all the stories we've been told our prototype is for what kidnapping is. So people accept the one that, is, that fits the prototype. prototype. I'll go over anchoring real quick because I think it's really interesting. Anchoring is this. If I ask, does anybody in here know how long the Mississippi River is? I always have to see if we have Jeopardy geography buffs in here. All right, no, good. You do? Thanks. Okay. Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> I have no idea, but I'm glad that you. That's a guess. So that's. I appreciate that. You. 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 You probably are right. I don't know. But if I, if the rest of us that don't have any idea, if I told this half of the room, the Mississippi River is is longer or shorter than 500 miles long. It is not 500 miles long. How long is it? You all had to write an answer down. And meanwhile, I gave you a card or told you in a separate soundproof room, the Mississippi River is not exactly 2,000 miles long. How long is it? Okay? And you all had to write it down. This group would be all, you'd be all over the place, right? You all wouldn't say 500 miles, but you would use 500 as your anchor. So your mean or median or whatever the, the number would be, would, if we averaged it out, would trend towards 500. You guys, on the other hand, would trend towards 2,000. Why? Because most of us, other than you, have no idea how long it is, and our brain's going, I ain't spending a bunch of energy because I'm never going to figure it out. I'll just use the number the guy gave me as a jumping off place. That's what anchoring is, and it's that you could say, well, yeah, you, but you kind of tied 500 or 2,000 miles to the length of the Mississippi River, They've done studies where they have people uh, fill out uh, information. And part of the information is they have to put the last four digits of their social security number down. And then they're sent into a room about 15 minutes later, and they have to guess or estimate the value of things that most people don't know the value. Like, what is this microphone stand <laughs> worth? You know, what is this, whatever the hell this thing is, worth? <laughs> right? <laughs> And people use their social security numbers as an anchor, the last number they heard. Again, if I'm a lawyer and I'm going to a mediation or I'm going to in front of a jury, oh, I've got a different way I'm going to do it because the way lawyers normally do it is I have a really high number, you have a really low number, and we meet in the middle somewhere. That ain't what I'm going to be doing from now on. If I want $750,000 for my client, I am going to walk into the mediation at the beginning and go, I am sorry I am late. My wife told me 750 things this morning. And then I had to park all the way out. And park like a parking space, like 750. It's like, 
750,000 miles away from the building. Because I'm going to use that. I won't go into just world. Um, I want to get to the last one, which is categorizing and generalizing. Our brains remember information based on uh, how uh, we put them into groups. Okay, so I normally bring, and I didn't bring it this morning because I was dabbing or trying to, <laughs> my iPad. And on my iPad, I have something that looks like a pen. It looks like this. And if, I, and, and if I show you this, you know how to use it, right? Because your brain has a category for things you write with. You don't have to inspect it and figure out, wow, I wonder what I do. How do I work this thing? What's this for? Which side do I use? You just know. Because you've got a category in your brain of things that, that you write with. And when they see that thing on my iPad, a lot of people put it, have it in that category, and they assume that that category has certain characteristics. And they look at me and they say, can I borrow your pen? But it's attached to my iPad, and it's not a pen, it's a what? A stylus. stylus. So they can't write anything with it. Usually you're right when you have these categories for things, people, and places. But sometimes you're wrong. And people are a lot more complicated than pens or things. And we do it with people as well. Meaning, I'm six foot six. If you were talking to me afterwards, let's say we have a, like a lunch hour or something, you're having a lunch, right? And we're talking at lunch. I guarantee you're going to ask me if I play basketball. I promise you you're going to ask me if I play basketball because that's a category that you put me in. And you want to be able to size me up. You don't know that you're doing it. You th may think you're the only one that's ever asked me that question, right? <laughs> but your brain is subconsciously framing who I am and how are you going to relate to me without you knowing that's what's going on. Because I've been asked 8 million times, 750,000 times. <laughs> And the, the truth is, a lot of tall people play basketball, but some don't, right? I did, so I have an answer, right? So that's good. Because I've got friends that are tall that, that don't, and they have, they have to always go through a half an hour explanation about why didn't you, and if I was your height, I would. <laughs> so I can just say, yes, here's where I play. Can we move on to the next topic? Uh, in our society, and the way you grow up, your experiences, but also what you're exposed to, governs the characteristics that you ascribe to the things in that category. I don't know if they have basketball in Mongolia or not. It's just the farthest away place I can think of. But let's say they don't have basketball in Mongolia. They still have a category for tall people, but they don't. the characteristics are different. So maybe I can't ride a horse, or I, I don't know. There's some categories or characteristics they have based on their culture and their experiences, but they still have that. A lot of those have nothing to do with race, gender, or anything else, right? But some do, because once I tell you I did play basketball, I know all y'all assume something else about how I play basketball. <laughs> yeah, I know y'all that are, know anything about basketball, I won't go through the whole thing because I'm taking up too much. That's why they're laughing at me because I talk too much. I won't go through the whole thing, but if you were guarding me on a basketball court and you were guarding Derek, Derek, stand up so everybody can see if you would. If you guarded one of us on the court and we caught the ball on the wing at the three-point line, I promise you, you would guard me differently. And in a basketball game, you got no time to consciously process anything. I promise if Derek caught the ball, you would take a step back. If I caught the ball, you would be right up in my jock. <laughs> right? You would be right up in my grill. Why? Because your brain automatically has a category about white basketball players. Do you know that? It does. It really does. Especially if you're a basketball player. Oh, it has one about everybody. Tall, short, thin, fat, white, black. And the stereotype is, or that, cat, that characteristic is, uh, Lou ain't got no first step. He can probably shoot. And he's real fundamental at setting the screen, right? But he sure as hell is not driving around me and dunking it. If he does happen to get around me because I trip, 
My boys have him at the rim and are just gonna throw his shit into the third row. Right? And for me, I will tell you, that's right. I can shoot a little, but I, I, I was never, I'm really old now, so I'm really slow, but I was never fast, right? So that would be a good strategy for me. I have a brother. He's white like me. He's tall like me. Everybody guards him the same way they guard me. But we're different in one respect. Two respects. He can't shoot a lick at all. He'll tell you that he can if you run into him, but it's a lot. <laughs> but he's got a good first step, and he will go around you, and he will revert. He loved to reverse dunk it, and then talk junk for the rest of the day. I've gotten him out of more fights because he talks so much junk. He made a living on that stereotype or that uh, heuristic that people had about how he played basketball, because people automatically got up on him. He went around. Him. I don't guard him that way because my brain has developed a different shortcut for him. I step off about 10 feet and say, shoot it. I would say, what are you shooting? Like, like, shoot it. And then he gets mad and he tries and he misses and I get the rebound and I laugh at him all day. Real last two things. We talked about this a lot. Does anybody know who's this guy? Who is this guy? Sterling. Donald Sterling. L.A. Clippers, they still aren't that good, even when they got rid of him. But that guy, it, it was explicitly biased. Now, I will say, with explicit bias, right? So explicit bias means, you can read it, but explicit bias means, no, you're, you're you, you, yeah, I think, yeah, I'll just go ahead and say it. But, well, he would say it behind closed doors, right, on the phone, when, there were, when he didn't know people were recording him. Yeah, I think black people are like this, and I think white people are like this, and yeah, I'm going to treat them differently, so what? That's explicit bias. Now, the thing about that is, <clears throat> a lot of people, especially now, won't acknowledge that, right? So he didn't acknowledge it until they caught him with those secret tapes. Other people who don't have these explicit biases still have this, what's called implicit bias, meaning... I'm not consciously processing it. It's not coming from here, my frontal lobe. It's coming from all those categories and characteristic, characteristics that go with those categories that were fed to me by my society and told to me by everything I heard growing up. And it doesn't matter, by the way, whether you're white, black, Hispanic. You all heard the same stories. You all got the same messages. It lives in our subconscious. And so we've got to figure out what to do about this because that's what we've done a lot with the explicit bias, right? We're really good at this. And this led, dealing with this has led to incredible progress in this country. Incredible progress. But we still got this to deal with. Raise your hand if you've ever taken an implicit association test, an IAT. Usually you do it at a computer and you have to tap the computer keys, right? And you have different images. Okay, I see probably about eight hands that went up. If you haven't, we were going to do one today, um, but in the, in the interest of time, I'm going to try and make up a few minutes that Judge Trosh took from us. Um, so in the interest of time, if you Google IAT or if you put in implicit bias Harvard, It'll take you to the website, and I apologize for not having the URL for you. It'll take you to the website where Greenwald and um, Banaja uh, do their research. And you can do it for free, you can register as a guest, and you can just mess around with that. It has all different kinds of um, examples of implicit association tests. Why do we have to use an IAT in order to measure implicit bias? Right, because you can't answer because you're not this guy, right? You don't know which implicit biases you have. They operate at a subconscious uh, level. So that's how we can get to um, what? Oh, yeah, there it is. Implicit.harvard.edu. That's how you can access your subconscious and actually have a measurement for it. So I'm going to really fast cruise through these slides because this would have been our IAT that you would have done. And um, how many of you guys have seen the monkey business illusion? All right. If you haven't, um, it's a short video. You can just Google the monkey I'll business just show illusion. It. No, we don't have.
It'll take it takes two minutes. Two yeah. minutes. Get it. It's a good. They need to see. All right. <laughs> <laughs> they need to see. Yeah. All right. If I'm looking at Aaron, Aaron, if I just click this link, do we think it's going to take me to the internet? Perhaps. Maybe. I see the spinning wheel of death. Going somewhere. Yay! Yay. Okay. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Hold on. Count how many times the people in white are passing the ball. Count to yourself. The white team to the white team with white shirts. We're going to ask you the answer at the end of this. Did you spot the gorilla? Raise your hand if you saw the gorilla. For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half is the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color for the player on the black team leaving the game? Anybody notice that? Let's rewind. <laughs> comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. <laughs> when you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. All right, so why don't we show this illusion? Why don't we show you that? What? What's the point? What's the point? Why did we show you the monkey business illusion? How do magicians operate? Look over here while I pull the quarter from behind your ear, right? How many times are we told? I mean, Judge Josh just stood up and told you all kinds of little brain tricks that we do, right? If we tell you to look at one thing, you're likely to miss other things going on. Think about how many times you're told, I'm looking at Deb again, right? You go into school, you're told, read the directions, fill out the form, do this, do this, sit in your seat, color in the lines. You're asked to do a lot of things, make the law school equivalent of your instructions, right? And sometimes when you're busy following the instructions, you're not looking at something else, or you're not looking over here at the gorilla, or the curtain changing, or the player leaving the game. I want to really quickly tell you a little bit about uh, a woman who I think is simply amazing, and MacArthur Foundation just recognized her with a genius grant. Her name is Jennifer Eberhardt. She was trained at Harvard and Yale, and now she's a professor at Stanford. She's a social psychologist, and she does uh, research studies on implicit bias. So I'm going to describe one of her many studies. She does a lot with uh, court applications too, so she has some vignettes with defendants, with jury selection, etc. You can again just Google her name and you'll find some of her research. I have a link of hers uh, provided as well. So this was kind of the study, this was one of the studies that she did and this is the one that she won the, the Genius Award for. She took Berkeley and, and Stanford students, current Berkeley and Stan Stanford students, and she divided them into three groups of participants. She invited them into the computer lab, and she showed them pictures. She showed them grayed out images, like the one you see here. So in frame one, it looked like your TV when your TV goes off at night, right? At frame 41, they all took 41 frames to become completely clear so you could tell what the object was. She used two kinds of objects. She used crime relevant objects and crime irrelevant objects. The crime relevant objects she used, a gun, a knife, handcuffs. Crime irrelevant objects, she used a stapler, 
a cup and a saucer, a bugle. She, to the three groups, set them in front of the computer and asked them to click the computer as soon as they recognized what the image was. Okay, everybody with me? Now the three groups were slightly different. The first group had no priming. When I say priming, the other two groups had priming. Group number two was shown photographs of Stanford faculty, staff, and students who were white. They were shown these pictures at 31 milliseconds, so their brain didn't see the pictures, despite the fact that their computer screen showed the picture. <coughs> when asked at the end of the study, no one remembered seeing anything but these images on the screen. The third group was primed with black photographs, again, Stanford faculty, staff, and student photographs during the study. All right, so let's see what she found out. Here is everyone, all the groups, group one, group two, group three, on crime irrelevant objects. How many frames did it take them to identify the objects? About 23, right? 23 here. 20, a little more than 24, and a little less than 23 there. Right, everybody with me? No statistical significant difference between how long it took folks to identify crime irrelevant objects. All right, let's see what happens when she shows the non-primed group crime relevant objects. What happened? Where are my math people in the room? Is this a dip, is this a statistically significant difference? No. no. It took them about the same amount of time to identify the crime relevant objects. Okay? You guys ready? Here we go. You're shown a white face. What happens? It takes you longer to identify a crime relevant object. It inhibits your brain's ability to pick out a crime relevant object. Everybody knows what's gonna happen next, right? Showing a black face speeds up your brain's ability to identify a crime relevant object. Your brain automatically goes there unbeknownst to yourself. So, without further ado, let's talk to you about how those messages get into your brain at that subconscious level. Okay, so I have a lot of notes here. Okay, and we clearly <laughs> won't go through them. Um, but I mentioned the term legacy earlier. What is a legacy? Or what do people mean when they say legacy? Or what are they implying? Anyone? Something that went before. A history. A history. What else? When people are like, okay, I went to a particular college and you're going to be my legacy. Right? What does that mean? Or when mentors, and again, I work in leadership. We throw the word legacy around all the time. What does that mean? You're my legacy. Yes. Follow the same path or development. Thank you for saying that, following the same path of development. So what's interesting is Lou brought up when he started um, that he's good looking, he's brilliant, he's a hard worker, but he's had some wind beneath his wings. So I want to sort of go over this concept of legacy through a very short 400 year history of this country. <laughs> Are you ready to talk about that in the next 10 minutes? <laughs> okay. So, um, 1607 is the first date I'm going to start with. And 1607 is when the first permanent English colony was established. Where was it established? Okay, Virginia, right? 
Okay. Now, let's, let's think about legacy for a minute. I could have started with an earlier date, but I didn't. What was that? What is an earlier date in the annals of our American history that I could have used? 1492. 1492. But there's an interesting word up here. It says permanent. Why does it say permanent? What's the significance? And what's the significance of it being permanent in Virginia? Any thought? It's when we start building our nation. It's how our laws, hi Charlotte School of Law folks, mm -hmm. become established. Okay, so we all get that. So that's why 1607 is important. So in 1613, a very significant marriage takes place with this um, lovely woman. Isn't she beautiful? Lovely woman right there. Who, who marries her? John Rawls. John who? Rawls. Okay, some of you are, are, are a little not sure. Because you, 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 you really wanted to say another name, <laughs> right? Um, and so is this the love story that uh, Disney illustrates? Yeah. Why? What happens? Why does he marry her? Yes. Um, I'm under the impression that it was John Rawls and that it was essentially to please her father, kind of like to bring sort of a let's all come together type thing going on. But oh, she was like 13, I think. So, but I'm not 100% sure. So. Not 100% though. And where did you? Okay. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? Why does he marry her? For it was for lamb. It was for lamb. It was not for love and matrimony, as we talk about in 2016. I'm finding my life partner. I'm finding my soulmate. Yes, it was land. Okay, so 1607, 1613. Um, then another significant thing happens in 1619, and that's when we have our first Africans that were kidnapped and enslaved. Why is that significant? <coughs> huh? I think it's perpetual. Perpetual. Yes. So that's when um, this is the beginnings of it being perpetual servitude. Okay. So are we? So are we? Are we clear for now? We have those three dates. So then we move to 1705. Again, 400 years. We're moving fast, people. And um, in 1705, Virginia, Virginia comes up again. Virginia law passed the following for white, free white indentured servants. Um, in the 1600s and in the, in the 1700s, were um, Africans the only people that were enslaved? No, who else? I mean, I've already kind of told you, but who else? Native Americans. Native Americans. Native Americans. Who else? White, white folks. <laughs> white folks, white folks, <laughs> and all of us, right? But in 1705, Virginia passed a law where freed white indentured servants received the following, 50 acres, so they received what? What's 50 acres? Land. Land. 30 shillings, which is what? Money. Money. 10 bushels of corn, which is? Food. Great. And a musket. What's that? A gun. So in 1705, Virginia passed this law. You with me so far? Legacy, remember that as we go along. So in 1776, Declaration of Independence, what does that state? All men are created. All who? <clears throat> All men are created equal and they're given what? Are they provided? Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. In 1776, who did that exclude? Everybody else. Yes, but it's still one of our 
upheld founding documents today. Right. 1776. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Um, but 1785 Land Ordinance Act, let's talk about it. Um, if you owned land from the 1600s to the 1700s, how do you know which land was yours? Do you know? So 1785 is what established this thing called boundary markers. Because in the 1700s, your land was your land, right, your, your, your 50 acres, but then the, 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 the rock or the, sh or the stream or the creek could be the boundary marker, but what, but what happens with rocks and streams and creeks? They shift, they move. So in 1785, this was put into place, and who benefited from this land ordinance act? White men white people um, because uh, we, we love to say white men, but where do white men come from? <laughs> <laughs> so it's both, okay? So when it comes to perhaps establishing laws and, and doing the business of establishing a nation, um, white men took the four, but who also benefited from that? White men. Okay. All right, so Land Ordinance Act. So can anyone tell me um, the Land Ordinance Act, what they were given? Voting rights. What? Voting rights. Oh, okay. What else? They were actually given more land. Okay, so the... Um, Land Ordinance Act actually offered 640 acres of land for a dollar per acre of land. Which means what? Which means what? $40. Really? Can you imagine the steal today? <laughs> if I could. Do you know how much 640 acres of land is? A whole hell of a lot. Right. Okay. So, um, 1790 is the Naturalization Act, which means what? It's the act that established citizenship. So, in 1790, who was a citizen? Okay. There's a thing. Are you following the thing? But we're going to get there. We're going to move on. Okay. So, um, 1865, 40 acres and a mule. What is 40 acres and a mule? Something I'm still waiting on. Something I'm still waiting on today. Something I'm still waiting on. Thank you for saying it. Thank you for saying it. Um, but what is 40 acres and a mule besides something we're still waiting on and the name of Spike Lee's movie company? What is 40 acres and a mule? What did that state? And you, and you don't have to keep whispering. Go it's ahead, Black people. They promised the slaves, didn't they? Yes, it's something that they promised the slaves. And what was the promise? <laughs> OK, so when they became free, what were they promised? 40 acres and a mule. 40 acres of land and a mule. Was this kept? No. No. But well, let's go back. This parallels what that was kept. Who were? White. White indentured servants. So, 1705, white indentured service were promised something. And they were promised a whole lot more than 40 acres and a mule. And they got it. Um, in 1863, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was delivered. What's the Emancipation Proclamation? 
freed slaves. But did it? No. What didn't it do? Say it again. Huh? Some that they were slaves, some still in slavery. But they just didn't know the, the law. So okay. they still kept them in slavery. Okay, I, I'm, I'm loving this history examination here. Um, and, there's a, and there's also a method to this madness when it comes to history. So um, he said some were enslaved and some were set free. What were the conditions of your enslavement? You were set free to serve in the military, correct? So it was like, if you, no? Okay, no. <laughs> um, and the, what is it? The conditions of your slavery still exist today. So, if you were enslaved, if you were brought back to the system, as it were, why? To work. If you were convicted for a crime. So 1863 is when convict labor actually became something permanent. And that mirrors what today? Law students. What does that mirror today? The entire prison system. That's where convict labor got its start. And so why? Why or how easy was it um, for freed Africans, freed black people, to actually go out with their newfound freedom and get a job and get land that they were never given, promise that was never kept. And for whatever reason, they were put back into slavery. What were they um, held for? Do you know? Do you know what crimes? Okay, what else? What else were crimes in 1863 that you... Oh, so someone said poverty. What else were crimes that freed Africans could be forced back into slavery for? If you looked at a white woman the wrong way, right? So that's what built this sort of system of convict labor. Um, you all are students, but all of us knows what it takes to run a business, run an organization, run a corporation, run an institution. What's the biggest expense? Labor. Workers. So, in 1863, this convict labor established what? Free labor. Free labor. Free labor. Okay. So, that's 1863. So, 1933, the New Deal. What's the New Deal? Anybody know? Yes, ma'am. FDR's attempt to get us out of the Great Depression. And so what was offered? You know how much? And do you know what um, it was? To get us out of the Great Depression, which means what? More what? More jobs. More what else? More what else? We love to say it in America. More opportunity. What else? It was an opportunity for there to be recovery, reform, and a reinvigoration of our economy. <laughs> okay? Remember 1933 and the New Deal. I'm going to skip to 1944 and the GI Bill. But before I do that, who are baby boomers? Who? Parents. Your parents. <laughs> and if you're a baby boomer, when were you born? After the war. What year was that? 19 what? Okay, so that's actually 1946, 45, 46 um, to 1964. So baby boomers, to those of us in this room, can be who? 
Us? Who else? Our parents? Who else? Grandparents. Um, so what is listed here under 1944 is significant. Why? Because it's something that has happened in our lifetime. Legacy. So the GI Bill was established. Explain what the GI Bill is. It says the Servicemen's Readjustment Act. Readjustment to what? Okay, so coming back to this American life. And so what happened to GIs when they came back from the war? Besides producing lots of babies. Because <laughs> everybody's glad to be home. What else happened? What were you given? Education, Okay, so education, housing. What else is important to us in the in, in America? What else was given? Jobs. Okay, jobs. Terrific. So the GI Bill was established in 1944. So um, there were servicemen of all kinds of races, correct, in our war. But who was the GI Bill given to? And also, around that time frame, there was the establishment of HBCUs. What's an HBCU? What are the others called? College. <laughs> All right. So, um, why were there HBCUs? Because in 1944, yes, um, people of color were not admitted. To uh, 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 were able to apply and go to colleges. So we had to establish our own. And so do you know that um, this uh, 1944, people being able to go to colleges established some very specific workers. And so I'm going to read here what it established. Um, 1944, in that time frame. It produced 450,000 engineers, 240,000 accountants, 238,000 teachers, 91,000 scientists, 67,000 doctors, 22,000 dentists, and more than a million other college-educated individuals who were what? Predominantly what? What? Because in HBCUs, were they offered the same level of education? No. No. In HBCUs, what were the primary fields? Agriculture. Agriculture. What else? Education. What else? What? Religion. Preachers. Thank you. So those three. Those three. Okay. So in 1944, if you were able to come home from the war, go to college for free, with all of these um, positions or sort of work placement positions available to you, and you were the head of your household, what could you establish for your family? What? A legacy. What were other people able to do? Black folks. What were they able to do? Work. Work. Okay. So, um, skipping on, you know, 
few more years to 2009. And I wanted you to remember 1933 for a reason. In 2009, something interesting happened. What happened? What is the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act all about? What was it called? Stimulus. Stimulus. And what was it supposed to stimulate? Economy. What? The economy. the economy. And how was it supposed to stimulate the economy? Jobs. What else? Businesses, small businesses were meant to be jump started. What else was meant to happen? What else was meant to happen? Thank you. Supposedly helping the housing market. But um, let me read you a few more statistics. Are you ready? And for, um, in 2009, through that period, 2009, 2013, there are 4,497 loans made in order to jumpstart the economy. Um, of those loans, give me a percentage of how many went to white firms. 89%. Who else has a number? 93%. 93%. Who else has a number? 97%. 97%. OK, so with those numbers, how many, um, how many loans were given to Asian firms? Two. Two? Okay. How many were given to Hispanic firms? <laughs> okay, there are all kinds of numbers flying around. How many were given to black firms? Okay. So, out of those loans, and I'm going to read you the numbers because it's important, $130 million. 91% were given to white-owned firms. Why? They owned more firms, and they were already established. How do you know? Legacy, right? Um, Four million went to each Hispanic-owned firms and Asian firms. So that's about 3% for each. And in 2009 to 2013, you want to know the number for black owned firms? It was $2 million, 1.5%. OK, so take you through this very condensed 15, 20 minute, 400 year history of the creation of this country, all in the name of this idea of legacy and where we are in 2016. Why? Why, law students? When we talk about implicit bias, when we talk about race, <coughs> when we talk about <coughs> It continues to be perpetuated. What else? Our nation was founded upon it. Uh, I mean, we pretty much helped create human trafficking when it came to being with you know, slaves and Africans. Um, so if something is starting and continuously passed down, it's kind of hard to break that cycle when it's continuously passed down. OK. So, what, what else? If you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. If you don't know, you're doomed to repeat it. <laughs> Um, here's the thing, law students, and we get this a lot with our work. That happened a long time ago. That happened in 1492. Okay, not, not, not really right. Like, people don't know their history, number one. But number two, it happened a long time ago. That has nothing to do with me now. Is that true? No. Why not? So many people, yes. Yeah. Um, because it's got such a long-standing history, our communities, our laws, the way that we live in the world, it's all shaped by essentially who's better than who, you know, what race is better than other races. So it impacts everything that we do and the way we look at the world. Okay. 
Um, I want you to read this. This should actually sum up our. Oh, you could hear. Will you say what you said one more time? Um, sure. Uh, I think it was something about how because it's got such a long standing history, it kind of has led into every aspect of our lives our laws, our communities, the way that you know, government has been set up. It, it just impacts everything that we do now. So it impacts all of our lives. And you, as students of this work, um, here's the great thing about some of the work that we're doing today is, um, and, let's, and let's go back to this word race and even racism. The good news is, is it's not scientific, which means what? What? It can be changed. The good news is, is that we made it up. Like race isn't something we have to be bound by. But the bad news is, we made it up. And it's our legacy, or each generation's legacy, to figure out, one, to know the history, to know our legacy, and to actively work towards unpacking it and letting that shape the decisions we make in the courtroom, the decisions that we make with our careers, the decisions that we make with our families, the decisions that we make in our communities. So um, up here is how Bob's great grandparents got into the USA. Also known as the wind beneath uh, Judge Trosh's wind. Yes. <laughs> so will somebody read the first box? Can you read it? Uh, I'll read it. Uh, Our immigration laws should make it easier for the right kind of people to immigrate. How Bob's grandparents became homeowners. We're happy to approve your mortgage loan. Sorry, we can't help you. And do you see who the, the couple is? Sorry, we can't help you. Mm -hmm. And around what year was that, according to the legacy? 19 what? Great. How Bob's dad began his career. We like you. You seem like you're one of us. We're offering you a foot in the door. And what's happening over here? Sorry, the position's been filled. And when, and when was that? What year would that be? Some people like now. <laughs> I tried to go get some things done yesterday, right? Um, the, the, the young women that were talking about, you know, I, I need to like, figure out how I'm going to adjust my name so they won't know who I am, right? How Bob's parents became homeowners. We only show homes in this neighborhood to the right sort of people. Lucky your parents can help you with, um, help us with this down payment. How Bob got through his teens. I'm letting you off with a warning, but if I catch you with drugs again, however, for this young woman over here, you're under arrest. And lastly, there's, there's Bob. And what does Bob say? He's never been a bitter <clears throat> So Judge Liu is going to um, tell you all a little bit more about how we can address this in this room. So um, <clears throat> What can you do about this, right? It's a big legacy. It's happened for a long time. It's wired into our brains. I guess we're just trapped with it. It's one idea. The good news is there are things that can be done. There are strategies to deal with implicit bias. We don't really have time to go through all of those today, but I can tell you that in the court system, we are now using what are called bench cards, which are checklists, which is one way that uh, research has shown you can trip up those mental shortcuts, not just with regard to race, but in general to make sure that you're getting all the information. So you have a list. These are the questions I need answered in a given hearing. If you don't go through the list, and I hate going through the list, by the way, because I feel like a robot. But if I don't go through the list, and they've actually, uh, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges did a study and judges looked at the list and they said, 
Say, for example, at a removal hearing when children are removed and placed in foster care, judges looked at the list and said, oh, I already asked all those questions. I already do all that. And when they observed them in court, they realized they thought they were doing all that, but because of time pressures and stress and assumptions and mental shortcuts, they weren't covering all the topics they thought they were covering. So we now have a checklist because if you get more information, it's harder to go on assumptions. And you're, it's easier to do what Lady Justice is supposed to do to weigh the real evidence. So that's one example of something we're doing in, uh, in our courthouse. Um, so there are a number of solutions. Um, one thing that I would tell you, if you're interested in this, I would, would suggest that you get involved with this initiative. It's called Race Matters for Juvenile Justice. You can read the mission and the vision. And essentially for me, that mission and vision means that in 40 years, it would really be nice if I was, it'd be really nice to still be alive. <laughs> and if I'm alive and they wheel me out to tell a group of people my story about the kids from McDonald's, that the audience has no idea what the difference is. And if I tell them one kid was white and one kid was black, they couldn't figure out who was in detention and who wasn't. That's our goal. You can see that Race Matters for Juvenile Justice started with an idea that we were going to change a few court practices. That's what we were going to do. And as we got into it, we realized it was a lot bigger than that. And so we have partnered, and this list is actually probably bigger now. We were listing it the other day at a retreat we had, and now it's so big it's, it's scary. Um, because all of the things that you just heard from Nakia make it a bigger issue. And so we just continue to reach out to people, and people reach out to us. If you're interested in knowing more about the, the things that we've talked a little bit about today in two hours, then I would suggest that you go, you go online to our website, which you can see here at the bottom, www.rmjj.org, and sign up for Dismantling Racism Workshop, which is a two-day uh, workshop that will change your life. Because it will go into a lot more detail than we were able to go in in two hours. I also want to say one thing to all my white brothers and sisters out there. When I first heard this stuff, I was like, so you're saying I didn't work hard. And you're saying I just got all my stuff from stealing from other people. F you. That's what I thought in my head. Now what I think is, yeah, I worked hard as hell. And my dad worked really hard. And so did my grandparents. And I am smart. And I have paid my dues and I've done a lot of things. But I've also benefited from things that I didn't even understand I was benefiting from. It can be both. It doesn't have to be one or the other. So we're working with people to try and figure out how we can address the disparities, disproportionalities, and the biases in our world, in the juvenile world. And now it's spreading. We were talking yesterday at our retreat, or two days ago at our retreat, about going beyond that. And I'm really proud to live in Mecklenburg County because unlike a lot of communities, our community is having real conversations. The school system, for example, Deb could talk about this as she was up here, met with a collaborative group to look at their entire discipline policy based on the statistics that they saw and what was going on in our school system and have addressed that and changed the discipline policy as well as work with our police department to create diversion programs for kids so that they don't come to the court system so that they're not arrested so we're doing a lot of things these are all of the initiatives i won't go into all of these because there's a lot of stuff going on uh, susan is, and uh, charles bradley who's the youth and family services director lead a data and research team and so we continue to monitor our data to see if we're moving the dial we have uh, the Dismantling Racism uh, workshops uh, where we are working together to make sure people are on the same page and working from the same set of definitions. Because if you have different definitions of what racism is or what disparity is, you talk past each other. You can't hear each other. So we have common, are creating 
common definitions. And I'm happy to report that over <laughs> And I'm here to answer questions briefly as we transition to lunch. But thank you so much for.